Thank you. <clears throat> to me, it's an almost impossible task to summary, summarize the findings of a five-year project in 30 minutes. But I'm going to try to do my best. Um, so this is basically the project title. The Determinants of International Migration, a Theoretical and Empirical Assessment of Policy, Origin and Destination Project uh, Effects. <laughs> so this, this is the... DEMIC is a, is a project, but also a research team within the International Migration Institute. And thanks to the generous funding, we've been able to significantly extend the research team beyond the initial four people. Um, besides myself, Matthias Tsaika, Maria Laurence Frahu, Edo Mahendra, Katarina Nutter, Simona Vezzoli, Maria Villares Varela are the key researchers within the team, but also Olenka Kanarova and Anis Resigier have. Uh, contributed significantly, particularly to the establishment of the databases in the, in the team. So I would really like uh, to, to emphasize that this has been a team effort. Well, what is the issue? What is the puzzle we try to address in the DIMIC project? It's this controversy about the effectiveness of migration policies, because here we can see sort of two camps, more or less, in, not only in research, but also policy debates, on the one hand, those who argue that borders are basically beyond control, and here is the famous statement by Jagdish Bhagwati, that the ability to control migration has shrunk as the desire to do so has increased. Borders are largely beyond control, and little can be done to really cut down on immigration. While on the other side, many prominent migration scholars have argued, that's actually not true. There is no major migration control crisis. We may have some incidents on borders, but by and large, people abide by the rules, they get visas, uh, most migrants are actually legal, uh, so it is sort of um, it is misleading to argue that migration policies have failed. But one thing that that struck me at the time is there's very little empirical evidence. Certainly, if you go back six or seven years ago, lots has have happened not only here but also elsewhere. Very little empirical studies that try to address this issue in a more systematic manner. And these contested effectiveness of policies reveal more fundamental theoretical empirical problems, uh, a more general lack of good quality research on determinants of international migration, and more particularly, a uh, researcher tries to systematically look at the role of states and policies. And this is part of the gap that this project has tried to fill. Now, if you go to the literature, and in a way I have to go back now to 2009, when, when I wrote a project proposal, if you looked then, in particular, we saw in the few studies that existed on migration determinants, particularly the quantitative literature, were useful, but there was this bias towards income and demographic factors, discounting policy factors, social factors, and cultural factors. Another uh, characteristic of the literature is the so-called receiving country bias, overwhelmingly focusing on what drives migration from a receiving country perspective. How can immigration policies affect migration? How does economic growth and destination uh, in, 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 or in the destination countries affect migration, and so on and so forth. But also a weak theorization of migration determinants. Most studies are hardly theoretically founded at all, or assume that migration is just driven by international inequality and poverty in origin countries, but actually don't test that proposition in the first place. So we often deal with a sort of sending country or origin country black box, a sort of implicit assumption that it's poverty, inequality, that creates this huge desire to migrate. And this ignorance of origin country migration determinants can lead to very misleading analysis. For instance, the example uh, of Turkish migration declining to Europe over the last decade or so has often been attributed to restrictive border policies, but we also know that Turkey has gone through a period of high growth. And similar debates um, have been going on on Mexican migration to the USA. What actually explains the decline? Is it really border controls, or is it actually the crisis in the US? And perhaps factors in, in Mexico with the economy growing. So and this reveals, uh, reveals a research gap. It is unclear how policies affect migration when taking into account other migration determinants in destination and origin countries. Because it is, in a way, not surprising if you, for instance, run a regression with lots of variables and you find that policies have some effect on immigration. But that's not the real question. The real question is, what sort of effect? How does it affect migration? How big is that effect of policies compared to other migration determinants? I think these are the real questions. It's the same for research that has to try to quantitatively assess 
whether social networks encourage migration. Now, there have been some very good studies on that, but in a way it's hardly surprising to find that there is an effect of a network on migration. I think we have to seek the nuance. And in the project, we try to find, we try to seek those nuances. The last thing is that almost all previous researchers that have tried to look at policy effects have ignored knock-on effects of restrictions on other migration flows. Because, for instance, if you restrict asylum inflows, perhaps it has some effect on asylum migration, but it may have knock-on effects on other types of migration, or migrants may start to migrate in different ways or to other countries. And those effects have hardly been taken into account. Which brings me to the aim of the project, which is to generate new theoretical and empirical insights into the way states and policies shape migration process in their interaction with other migration determinants. Which leads me to the sort of four main research questions that the DEMIC project has tried to address. First of all, the bigger picture, because we thought we cannot really assess policy effects if we don't have a broader understanding of what has been the nature and structure and evolution of global migration over the last half a century. And second, how can these bigger shifts in global migration patterns be explained from broader processes of development and social transformation, not just in destination, but also origin countries? And the third question is a very essential question. What has been the nature and evolution of immigration and immigration policies over that same period? We often assume there has been an increase in restrictiveness, for instance. Is that really true? And can we talk on such terms? And then this brings us to the sort of more empirical questions of the project. What are the effects of migration policies and border regimes, not just on the volume, but also timing, duration, direction, and composition, so the selection, who migrates, of international migration. The DEMIC methodology consists of four main <coughs> parts. First of all, the elaboration of a theoretical framework on migration, trying to see migration as an intrinsic part of broader processes of development and social transformation. Secondly, to try to conceptualize migration policy and migration policy effectiveness. What do we mean when we talk about migration policy effectiveness? And also there we saw a big gap when we started the project that actually not a lot of research has been done on that. So we needed to define, first of all, what we're talking about. Third has been the creation of several databases compiling bilateral migration flow, visa, and migration policy data. And fourth, the empirical studies. And here we have decided at some point, although the project initially focused on quantitative testing, that we needed also qualitative case studies to capture factors that we can't simply ca capture with a more quantitative work, to really get a more a triangulation between different methods of looking at the same issue. Well, we have established four databases. First of all, three years of extremely hard work of the project team went into the establishment of our bilateral, so-called C2C, country-to-country -country database. Uh, which contains 34 uh, destination countries, not uniquely OECD countries. We have tried to add some other countries, covering up to 160, no, about 200 origin countries. So it's really country-to-country -country flows um, over this post-war period. Uh, while we were collecting bilateral data, we also collected total in and outflow data because these are available for many more countries. So we thought, why not? collect those data as well and establish another database, which is a that database with much more coverage uh, because many more countries um, uh, uh, um, gather such data. Then the DEMIC policy database. Uh, this has lasted until uh, the beginning of this year, basically, which is based on an extensive review of OECD, SOPIMI reports, and a lot of other national reports on migration policies, in which we track for 45 countries over the post-war period policy changes. And we coded them by policy area, policy tool, migrant category, and geographical origin. And this database doesn't only focus on immigration policies, but also about out-migration policies, also to try to overcome this sort of receiving country bias and try basically to see every country in the database as both a receiving and an origin country. And um, this database contains 6,500 migration policy changes. The last database is also something we developed in the project while we were doing the research. We discovered that the International Air Travel Association, 
uh, publishes monthly books on, on tra travel visa requirements. And this is a great tool, we discovered, to actually establish a bilateral visa database, a panel over 40 years, as one way to proxy restrictiveness of countries. And the big advantage of this database is it is completely bilateral and has completely got global coverage over the last 40 years. If you're interested, go to our website and there are several papers that explain the methodologies behind the data collection. I cannot do justice to that at all today. Well, we have published working papers over the last four years uh, containing analysis, main insights of the projects. It's impossible to summarize everything, so I would like to encourage you. It's also in your conference packs and on your USB sticks. And some of these papers have, in the meantime, been published in uh, some of the journals. What I'm going to do in the remaining 20 minutes is to share with you some main results and insights. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's to share with you some main results and insights uh, of the project. Um, luckily, there will be some presentation during the conference that, that of, of, of the, all the team members that give more detail uh, on the different papers and insights we have accumulated in the project. But let me run through the main research questions. First of all, about the nature and evolution of global migration. And this is an exercise we did before our databases were ready, using existent, existing data, for instance, uh, the migrant origin database from the World Bank, to try and explore these issues. Based on the idea we can only understand policy effects if we have a broader understanding of the evolution of migration patterns around the world. <coughs> and also the factors driving them. And this has helped us to dispel some common misunderstandings about migration and its presumed policy effects. First of all, the analysis challenged the idea that there has been a global increase in relative volume, diversity, and geographical scope of migration, which is a very common assumption in the literature. Current migration is not really exceptionally high, certainly not in relative terms. And if you calculate the global the number of international migrants of the world population as a percentage as a percentage of the world population, the rate has remained relatively stable. What about distance? This idea of migrant travel over larger distances because of globalization and ease of travel. Well, there has been a slight increase in the average distance a migrant travels from origin to destination, but it isn't as spectacular as some people would presume. What about this idea of super diversification that migrant populations have become much more diverse. Um, also here, there, there, it's a mixed picture. Uh, we don't, cannot really claim there has been a big diversification. I'm going to show you uh, some of the results later on. But first of all, the main change in migration has been directional. And this is basically using C2C data from our databases. And we, we pulled them all together to try to get a general image of how inflows have changed to the EU 25 and the US over the last decades. And we clearly see the EU, Europe more in general, rising as the prime global migration destination. And if you really take a long-term perspective, we come from centuries of Europeans moving out, colonizing, occupying other countries, from Europe becoming a migrant destination, which has reshaped global migration patterns, which has literally changed the face of migration all around the world. And that has been the big change, the big change. And in a way, it's understandable from a European perspective that this is the age of super diversity and, 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 and highly diverse immigrant population, which is true in Europe, but you can't make that statement on a global level. We have also looked at the spread, and I can't go fully into the methodology, but this is a paper Matthias Zeika and I wrote um, about uh, the globalization of migration. If we calculate the spread of migrant population, you get to, to approximate diversity you get a, a, a bifurcated picture. Because if you look from a receiving country perspective, a destination country perspective, yes, immigration, immigrant populations have become more diverse. If you look from an origin country perspective, the reverse has happened. And what it basically means is that migrant flows have become more asymmetric. More countries have entered the global migration playing field, which means more countries than ever have a significant share of the population living abroad, but they tend to concentrate in a shrinking number of prime destination countries. So migration has globalized from a destination country perspective, but much less so from an origin country perspective. So migrants from an increasing diverse array of origin countries 
concentrate in a decreasing pool of prime destination countries, and the number of net immigration countries has actually decreased. Well, what can we say about the determinants, just based on that data? Now, it's of course very tempting to state that migration is driven by international inequality, which fits within the standard push-pull framework. And nobody would deny that, but I think it would be stating the obvious. We need to go further than just making that statement. And it doesn't really allow such, um, s such assumptions to understand real-world migration patterns. For instance, why see you such, such a lot of migration between equally wealthy countries, and why are the poorest countries most migratory? We need to find further nuances. And we should stop by only focusing on volumes, but much look at broader processes of development and how do they change the nature of migration. So, what drives migration? Is it just the economy? This is a chart, and you can draw these charts from many countries, of GDP growth on the blue line and net immigration rates, and we see a very close association, which mainly means the business cycle determines to a large extent job creation, the levels of migration into countries, which perhaps also put in perspective what migration policies can do, or perhaps the aim of migration policies is not actually to stop migration, but to make migration in a way serve the business cycle, and that's another topic uh, I can come back to. But if we look at what actually drives migration in a more broader sense, if we look at development trends, what we see if we take all countries of the world together and we divide them in quintiles from the least developed to the most developed countries, we see that the more, the higher the level of human development, the more immigrants in terms of percentage of population. Not a big surprise. Some people are more surprised by the blue graph which basically means the countries that have a sort of medium level of development have the highest emigration rates. And that challenges some of the assumptions that, for instance, development in sub-Saharan Africa will decrease migration, or that is a sort of solution to migration. Basically, based on such figures, you would uh, expect the reverse. And a lot of papers, a lot of research has been done on this, also by other people like Michael Clements, which seems to confirm this more general picture that development generally seems to increase migration, particularly in earlier stages. Also a forthcoming Demic paper I wrote with Marie Laurence Flau shows that in Africa migration is generally positively associated to demographic and economic transitions. So migration seems structurally rooted in broader development trends. But how is still a contested issue, and I think a lot of more research should be done on this, because this is just focusing on a very crude general picture, but I think there is much more work to be done. And tomorrow actually is largely dedicated to discuss this entire relation between broader processes of development and social transformation and migration. But why do we find these associations? That is the big question. Why is this sort of idea of transition theory, which has been first by, hypothesized by Wilbur Zielinski, why do we see that? And perhaps here there has been a lack of theorization uh, on why do we see that. And perhaps a framework uh, that also has been called the capabilities aspirations framework can help us to understand this. It's not only because if you have more resources you're better able to migrate. But I think if we look at aspirations, things like education, increasing people's life aspirations, and generally these aspirations cannot be fulfilled where people are, also drives people to migrate. It's not just a matter of reacting to international income differentials or being pushed out. People have to take active decisions. And I think the aspiration side is very important, that we need to better understand how broader processes of development and social transformation shape people's migration aspirations. And luckily on the last day, we have a special session on this issue as well. These are just some papers we have written as part of the project on these different topics. How does inequality, social security and origin societies uh, drive migration? Um, also by some of the Demic friends like Lucia Korakova, who's not part of the core team, but has been closely associated to the project, and papers on how relative deprivations and aspirations in origin countries drive migration. What about the nature and evolution of migration policies, which is the sort of third main theme, theme of the project? Well, I apologize for the limited readability of this graph, but um, it is important also when we started to discuss why do we have this idea that migration policies have failed? Why is that so prevalent? Partly it's because we came to the conclusion 
the, there's a huge disjuncture between the discourse and the rhetoric and what actually happens in practice. And uh, this idea of this gap between public discourses about migration and the actual migration policies on paper, and I'll share some of those insights later, is quite big. And if we would take what politicians say at face value, as this is the policy, and see migration only increasing, it's easy to come to the conclusion that migration policies have failed. But if we look at the actual policies, we see a much more nuanced picture, and we can't really state that migration policies have generally become more restrictive. I'll show you the results quite soon. So we try to distinguish several gaps. There is a discursive gap between the discourse and the policy. There is an implementation gap between policy and what happens on the ground. And unfortunately, we couldn't measure that in this project, and we acknowledge this is a huge gap. And then is, there is the efficacy gap. So if we implement a policy, how effective is it in influencing the direction, volume, composition, and timing of migration when we take into account all the other migration determinants? And that bottom box should probably be much larger to, to sort of indicate the magnitude of importance of these other factors. And the project really did not try to look at this course, it really tried to look at what are the policies and to what extent do they have an effect on uh, migration uh, when we control for all sorts of other factors. So we have to distinguish between effectiveness and effect. Because effectiveness is what is the aim of the policy and what comes out. The effect is there is a policy in place and what influence does it have on migration. Well. I'll build this assumption about migration policies have become more restrictive. I'll show you one graph, and on the last day, Katharina Nutter will present extensively a paper we have written on this. What we have done in the database for 6,500 policies, we have tried to track for every single policy, and this is following a methodology by Maida and a paper by Perry and his colleague, on trying to establish for every policy change whether it has been more or less restrictive. It's a sort of zero-one coding. What we have done in this graph is for every single year covered in the database is to calculate simply the average yearly change of all policy changes in all the countries covered. And what you can clearly see is that the entire post-war period, the average direction of restrictiveness change has been negative, which means you cannot make the statement, generally speaking, that overall immigration policies have become more restrictive. On the whole, the reverse seems to be the case. Now, there is a lot of nuance to be added, and this, this will be done by Katarina on the last day, because it, of course, depends to which groups you are looking. And just give a snapshot from our visa database. This is an index we calculated for OECD countries, how restrictive they are towards African nationals. It basically calculates the average uh, for every year of all OECD countries. It calculates the, the, what is the percentage of African countries that need a visa to enter those countries. And clearly, we see a picture here that OECD countries have been closing in many ways to poor migrants from poor countries. Because the visa is perhaps not such an obstacle for high-skilled people that can get in. And we see high-skilled migration policy have become much more liberal over the last years, but we clearly see a move towards closure here. So this is important, I think, as a nuance. What about the role of states and policies in migration policies? Also here we have tried to do some work in terms of conceptualizing. And we have defined what we have started to call in the project substitution effects, the unintended consequences of immigration restrictions. And we have defined four. First is categorical substitution, the idea that migrants just jump to another category, or what used to be legal migration becomes irregular migration. Migrants may adjust the timing of their migration. The so-called now or never or beat ban rushes. I'll give you an example later. What has been less studied is that restrictions may decrease inflows, but they also are likely to have an effect on the reverse migration flow. How does it affect return? So how does it affect circulation? How does it affect net migration? Again, the, the receiving country focus is also reflected here. Almost all studies are about how does it affect inflows, not the total pattern of circulation. And last but not least, the spatial pattern. So if one country makes it more difficult uh, for particular origin groups to enter, how does it affect migration to other countries? I'll give you a few examples from our research on all these four effects. First, this idea of categorical substitution. And this is probably the best documented effect in the literature. There is a lot of qualitative and case study based evidence on this. 
Um, for instance, Turkish so-called guest worker migration or Mexican migration to the US, there is a lot of research, both quantitative and qualitative, that shows that uh, more restrictive policies have led to a change in migration strategy, with migrants more and more relying on family instead of the labor channel in order to enter uh, destination countries. That's not really a new story, but also the DEMIC project has generated both descriptive and inferential evidence in that direction. Uh, one uh, paper that will be presented uh, also in this conference by Matthias Tsaika shows that uh, asylum, restrictive asylum po policies lead to a deflection into irregularity. Uh, a paper by Katarina Natter uh, tracking 50 years of Maghreb and migration uh, shows the same pattern, that there has been this shift from labor to uh, family migration, as has been described for other countries like Mexico, for instance. What about this other effect, this sort of now or never migration? The idea that restrictions can compel migrants to adjust the timing of their migration. The idea of the beat to bend rush is not completely new. Kerry Peach has written um, a very interesting study back in the 1970s, I think, on so-called West Indian migration. Uh, but also Simona Pezzoli, who is, who is part of the DEMIC team, has written a paper and will later on give a presentation on her research trying to compare the three Guianas in Southern America to look at these effects, and the case of Suriname is probably the most illustrative of these effects. Immigration from Suriname to the Netherlands uh, was on a relatively low but increasing level in the 1960s and 1970s. The Dutch government pushed for independence of Suriname partly with the idea it will stop free migration because Surinamese were the Dutch, the Dutch, Dutch citizens, they could move freely. Well, what did Surinamese think when they saw independence was coming? It's now or never. And see, there was a huge migration peak. Then the Dutch thought we need to introduce a visa. And once again, Surinamese thought, it's now or never, another migration peak. What it means is that in a period of about 10 years, up to 40% of all Surinamese migrated to the Netherlands. So the policy had the complete opposite of the intended effect. The next effect has, I think, been very important to the project. It's trying to look how does migration, how do the restrictions affect the overall pattern of circulation? And here we have looked at this reverse flow substitution. So how does immigration barriers affect reverse flows? Now, this is still an ongoing research trend. We still have to do a lot of analysis, but I'd like to, do, to share some of the insights of a paper uh, Matthias Tsaika and I have written using the visa policy days, database and the migration flow database, the bilateral database, to see how visas affect those dynamics. What we found, based on data from 40 destination countries and over 200 origin countries between 1960 and 2011, that depending on the estimation technique, and I'm not going to, into mu too much detail here, Visa requirements reduce migration in both directions, between 26 and 68 percent on inflows, and between 18 and 88 percent on reverse flows. Depends a bit what, what technique you use, but largely the inflow reducing effect of a visa is largely counter or entirely counterbalanced by a similar effect on pushing people into permanent settlement and preventing actually return. And this seems to confirm this hypothesis. Interestingly enough, we also try to look at the um, uh, uh, relative magnitude of this effect. And one of the findings was is that visas significantly reduce the responsiveness of migration to economic fluctuations. You saw the chart of the Netherlands, you know, this is largely EU migration. Normally migration is very responsive to economic fluctuations. Actually, visas interrupt that responsiveness of migration. Basically, if a crisis, to give an example, if a crisis hits Europe or the US, Moroccan or Turkish migrants will stay put, or Mexican migrants will stay put, and will not return. And this is one of uh, the graphs in our paper, where we try to look also at, at the timing. Uh, zero is the year of visa introduction, how it affected circulation of migrants. This is a sort of turnover. It's immigration plus emigration. And we find a gradually decreasing effect on turnovers, which means migration interrupts circulation. Also, another paper using unique uh, survey-based data from the MAFE project, combining it with our policy data by Marie-Laurence Flahou, finds 
uh, a significantly redu migration reducing effect on restrictions and she will later present a paper. I'm through time. I'm almost there. Uh, the spatial substitution effect also here we're starting to do analysis on that and also here we find significant um, effects in deflecting migration to other destinations. We find robust evidence that the introduction of visas increase migration from the same origin country to other important destination countries. And they seem to largely undermine the immigration reducing effects of visa to a particular destination country. Although we find a lot of variation in the extent to which it is the case, and it also depends on similarity of destination countries in terms of culture, language, and opportunities. So these substitution effects have been the core of the empirical work we have done over the last two years. There's one thing I need to add is that we increasingly realized throughout the project we need to move beyond immigration policies. By focusing on immigration policies, we in a way reproduce, of we, we may magnify the importance of migration policies, and that states probably influence migration in much more powerful ways through other policies, like economic policies or welfare policies or education policies. And that that is still a big uh, gap in the literature, uh, which needs to be addressed. Now, some of our team members in their own uh, PhD work, in particular by Edo Mahendra, he's, and he will present a paper out later at this conference, for instance, tries to look at the reverse welfare magnet. Because the welfare magnet is that you're totally focused on Europe and the US. But how does welfare in origin country affect migration? Also, Lucia Kurakova, who has written papers for Demic, shows for Central and Eastern Europe that the level of welfare provision in origin country has a significant effect on out-migration from those countries, a reducing effect, effectively. And Simona Pezzoli has done, uh, focused her own research on the role of the origin states and trying to unpack this colonial dummy. And she will also present work on this later in the conference. And here there's some other papers we have presented as part, uh, we have written as part of the project. So let me conclude. The first point perhaps seems surprising because we find all these you know, substitution effects and the relative lim li limited effectiveness of immigration policies. Still, it would be an exaggeration to say that immigration policies have failed because we focus very much on those policies to try to stop particular forms of migration that are either discursively or really not seen as, um, 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 as desirable. And it is also based, this idea of migration policy of field, that migration policies are basically about stopping migration or curbing migration. This is exactly what the work on the policy database has tried to refute and try to bring much more nuance in that debate that you cannot generally state that immigration policies have become more restrictive. They are primarily about selection not about influencing numbers, although that demonstrates often the rhetoric of politicians. If you look at the reality of policy making, they are much more nuanced. Then we cannot just generally argue they are ineffective. Most migrants abide by the rules. But restrictions have real but limited effects on migration because these migration trends are rooted in much more structural development trends. And the effectiveness of immigration restrictions is significantly undermined by these different substitution effects. People jump category, people adjust the timing of their migration, people move to or through other destinations, and less people start returning. And these hypotheses seem to be largely confirmed by research which we are doing in the project. And I think a very important point also for future research is that destination origin states mainly influence migration through so-called non-migration uh, policies. So how are we going to move further uh, in the project, and we hope to continue doing research even after the project is finished with the data we have, I think we need much more sophisticated measurement uh, of policy effectiveness and substitution effects. Because it's not just a matter of do, does a visa stop, uh, what effect does a visa have. We want to use the policy data, which is much more nuanced and defines target groups and um, goes in much more depth to try and look much more in what to questions in what circumstances are policy less or more effective, in what type of countries and what types of broader contexts. We want to extend the databases in terms of historical depth and global coverage, because one thing to mention perhaps is that there was much more migration data available than we ever imagined, but we also discovered the deeper you dig, the more you find, but digging deep is very costly and time consuming. But we're actually very optimistic that there is much more there in the archives. <laughs> 
Implementation is a huge gap, and there are some researchers here in the room that do research on implementation. I think it's a very important issue that we link to sort of more formal analysis we do to much more qualitative research that tries to look into the implementation of migration policies. And last but not least, the effects of non-migration policies. Well, last slide, I just want to thank a huge number of people, we counted 74, who've been supporting the project in terms of Within IMI, our fantastic support team, uh, people who've contributed to the project significantly by giving feedback, writing papers, and the different people that worked as reviewers, data entry people, um, and, and different, different tasks on the different databases we have been uh, establishing over the last few years. So, I would like to thank you.